at the time I had to choose between paying rent, which seems pretty important, and buying a camera, so I chose paying rent. Now I can pay the rent with my camera, so it's like a whole new world. Hey everyone, welcome to Equine Photo School. This is episode 46. This one's going to be on YouTube and the podcast, which is kind of nice to have some visuals, I guess. You get to see my smiling face if you're on YouTube. Uh, if not, then hey, check out the podcast. I appreciate you guys all listening. We did just break that 10,000 download mark uh, a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, so super cool that we've done that. Uh, thank you all for listening. I appreciate it. I'm your host, Oli Moss, as many of you probably know that by now, and today is going to be a solo episode. Just you and me talking about barrel racing photography. So let's dive into it without too much further ado. I just... I am gonna plug the course here at the end. I've got a new barrel racing photography course coming out. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that later on in this episode. But for now, at the beginning, just kinda of wanna walk you through like, how do I know this stuff about barrel racing photography, right? So I'm gonna take you through like little origin story, how I got started, how you can get started, and kinda of just walk you through some things that are important to know about barrel racing photography. because. There's kind of a lot to think about, really. So if you think about the overarching, like what does it take to be a barrel racing photographer? You just take pictures during a barrel race, right? Pretty simple. But there's a lot that you can really narrow in on the details. If you hone in on these details, you think through things, you figure out what angles, what shots, what where to sit, what camera settings to use, the whole thing, right? There's a lot that can go into barrel racing photography if you really want to be good at it, if you really want to make some money at it, if you really if you really want to go after this thing, I've got this course that's going to be great. And we're going to talk about that later. I'm building the course as we speak, currently in progress, right? So I haven't, I haven't launched it yet. We're just going to start talking about it. I'm going to tell you about some of my things in there, get some feedback from you. So if you got any ideas as you're listening to this episode and you think man i want to know more about that in the course reach out let me know send an email go on facebook on instagram whatever you want to do follow us at equine photo school all over social media back in the day when i got started in barrel racing photography i had owned a camera for approximately one week okay it was like my very first thing that i ever did was shoot this barrel race i i was working for peabody energy I was a landman, an intern in their landman program, and it, it was a pretty good job, and it could have been a really good job, but I didn't, I didn't love it, and uh, and it was just killing my back. I was hunched over with my iPhone, like I was like this all day long, taking pictures of these pages on the sheet, and it was just like murdering my back, and it it hurt so bad every day. I would just lay there and just oh man, my back would kill me. But I looked around and I saw all these other landmen that were and women <laughs> these other land professionals they were using a dslr they had a like a real camera and they were rigging it up with lights and this whole thing and they were snapping pictures with a real camera like a dslr and it was super cool and i thought well that looks like the ticket right and i i bought the contraption and and then i was saving up to buy a camera and i told my parents i said man this is this job's killing my back. This hurts so bad every day. And my birthday was coming up, so they decided to surprise me with an early birthday present, and they bought me my first DSLR. It was a Canon 70D, and it just happened to be during a promotional period that came with a printer, so more on that later. Uh, but it was great. So I had this I had this camera, and they, they'd shipped it to me where I was working. And so the, that, that night after work, you know, I, cr I opened up everything, and tested it all out, pushed all the buttons, tried the things, you know, through the owner's manual to the side like you do, and just started, you know, trying to figure out this thing, this magic black box, and it came with this little kit lens, and, you know, it was just basic, basic camera gear, right? Like, we've all been there, been excited to open up our first camera and get after it, and that was me. I was super excited, and I had no idea how to operate this thing, but I gave it my best shot. So the next day, what did I do? I took it to work, and I tried to use it, in this this poorly lit it was like before the contraption came in with the lights and all this right so it was it was a mess and i was trying to take these pictures and i thought my camera on my phone was probably super low res so i i went through the menu system on my camera and reduced the image quality like an idiot 
And so it was just like, I, I got back to the office at the end of the day and I was so proud of what I did and I was showing my boss, like, look at my new camera. And I, I did it like all the other people did. And if I'm gonna be doing this job for a while, I need to invest in the right gear, right? And, and it was just killing my back with the iPhone. And she's like, no, I really, I really wanted you to use your iPhone because like, that's better. Those people are doing it the old way, the iPhone's the new way. It makes it into a PDF. Like I had this great app that made everything into one PDF and it was great. It was actually really nice. And I was like, well, I can, I can probably do that in like Microsoft Word, probably, <laughs> right? And so I thought, well, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm gonna try to learn how to convert these images into PDFs with Microsoft Word. And as you can imagine, that was a hot mess. And like I said, I reduced the image quality on my photos so you couldn't even read the text. You could zoom in all you want and all you'd see was just big blocks of pixels. It was awful. And I had to turn up the ISO so high to get a proper exposure. So I could, not even proper exposure, but just so I could see the pages. It was miserable. It was so dark in there. So the iPhone was the clear choice. It was the, it was the clear winners. So I had to go redo the work that I did the day before and redo that with my iPhone the next day. And she said, don't bring that camera back here. You cannot use that at work. You should have asked me first and I would have told you no and given you more reasons why we just used our phones for this job. And so I couldn't use it for that. So I was kind of like a little devastated, I guess, you know? I was, I was feeling bad for myself because I had made a fool of myself, right? And I, I just like, it wasn't working. It wasn't working for that job and I felt frustrated that my parents had spent all this money. It felt like so much money. It felt really expensive. It was probably like 1500 bucks or something, but I thought, how am I ever going to make enough money to pay them back for this? But it was a gift. They didn't want me to pay them back, but I thought, well, I can't use it. I can't make money with it the way I, I thought in my little monkey brain here. I thought I can't make money with it and so it's useless to me and I'm not gonna be an artist of any kind, right? Even though even though I've wanted a camera my whole life, right? Like I'd, I'd been wanting a camera for a long time. My dad remembered that I'd wanted a camera years ago when my sister got a camera. And it was like, oh man, I really wanted one. But I, at the time I had to choose between paying rent, which seems pretty important, and buying a camera. So I chose paying rent, uh, good choice, I think. And you know, later, later on, I, now I can pay the rent with my camera. So it's like a whole new world. But at the time, you know, it was like, you gotta make these choices and it was a hard call. So I, my dad remembered that from years ago. So he felt like it was time that I bought a camera. And so he gave me this camera and it came with a printer, which is super cool. But I was like, what am I gonna do with the printer? Like, I don't wanna print off these pictures of this and I'm not gonna print off my selfies, you know? So I, I just kind of put the printer aside and didn't really think about it, right? But that night I called my dad and I said, and my parents called them both really. And I, I said, listen, we got to try to return this or something. And they said, no, just keep it. Just keep it. I said, but there's no way for me to make money with it. I really, you know, feel like I should make money with this thing because it costs so much that it just seems frivolous to just let it sit here and make, you know, artsy partsy pictures or something, you know, I was kind of just like feeling bad for myself. Right. So they said, well, we've got a barrel race coming up at there, they had the Wrangler Classic, which they used to own the Wrangler Horseman Rodeo News, and they had this, uh, they had team ropings and barrel races and stuff to promote that, their newspaper. So they had the Wrangler Classic coming up, it was one of the last ones they ever did. And they said, why don't you come and shoot the barrel race? And, and then our friend Daryl, he's been a photographer for a lot of years, and he's got this system down, and he will kind of teach you everything you need to know, you know, he could be like your little mentor and he could teach you what to do and how to do it. So just come shoot this event. And we kind of came up with some, you know, like I'm, I'm a little money motivated. You probably know. Uh, so, you know, my dad helped me like think it through, like, you know, he really pushed me into doing it. I didn't want to do it. I had no desire to shoot barrel racing. I had no, no desire to do anything with horse and rodeo stuff. I was, as a kid, I'd, you know, help them with their events and I grew up around horses and rodeo stuff my whole life and they have the Wrangler Horse and Rodeo News, so it's like, it makes sense, right? But I never really wanted much to do with that. I kind of, you know, wanted to go go to college and like make something of myself instead. So I really didn't want to do this, right? But with some prodding and some, you know, nudging and a little guilt sprinkled on top, you know? Um, they got me to do it. They got me to shoot my first barrel race. And, uh, you know, we kind of talked about how many pictures I could maybe sell. And if everybody bought a picture, it'd be like all this money. And it was like, nah, not nobody, 
you're never going to get everybody to buy your picture. That's just, well, that's not true. I have sold a picture to everybody in the past, but there's, there's loopholes, there's ways around it, and it's different. We'll talk about that later. Probably not in this episode. Um, but here's the deal. I went there, and each day, it was a two-day event, and each day was approximately four hours long. So I, I worked eight hours, and I made more money in eight hours than I did in the previous 40 hours at my real job. Not a, not a lot more, but more. And, and I thought, light bulb went off. I was like, wow, this is, this is so much better than I expected. I thought it was gonna be a total flop. I thought everybody's gonna laugh at me and I can't, I don't know how to take pictures. You know, so I had a week, I had one week between when I got my first camera, had no idea how to run it, and I took some miserable pictures in the courthouse uh, to when I shot my very first barrel race. And I had to learn a lot because guess what? Daryl never showed up. Now, unfortunately, our friend Daryl's passed away from COVID uh, not too long ago. So how did I how did I make all this money, right? <laughs> so let's let's get this straight. I was shooting this barrel race, and how did I know that I made that much money by the end of the weekend? That's because I was selling on site. I sold these people, these barrel racers, prints right there. I was printing on site day one. And how did I how did I do that? If I'm in the arena shooting pictures, I wasn't, I was outside the arena. I didn't I didn't have the spot picked out yet, but I had a system and I mapped out this system. I just got out, I just got out a little piece of paper and I wrote down my little system here and I kind of had a flow of things and I hired an employee. I hired somebody that was working for my parents and so I already knew she was a good employee and she needed a little side income. She wanted a job for the weekend. So it was like a match made in heaven. I needed an employee, she needed a job. It was perfect. She got a little side income and then I made my profits on top of that. So it was super cool. I, I was learning how to take pictures. <laughs> I was learning, you know, how to operate a system that I invented the day before or the week before. And then I was learning to be a boss all at the same time. So I had a lot on my plate. There was a lot going on. Uh, we made some mistakes. Of course, of course we did. I had no idea like what to show her how to do because I'd never done it myself. But I kind of had a rough idea. I'd learned in the last week to kind of how to edit a picture sort of. And I figured out how to print and connect everything together. I had this old junky laptop that I was using for school. And it was, it was not a great nothing was great like it was it was a total joke now you know now I, I can make more than that in half a day or you know an hour than than what i made all weekend then but i worked four hours each day two days eight hours i made more money than i did in my regular nine to five job making 20 bucks an hour for 40 hours like i made more than that in eight hours <sighs> crunched it way down so super cool and you know and that's including paying her and this whole thing and sure, sure, my parents gave me $1,500 worth of camera gear, but I bet you already have more than that in camera gear right now, so think you starting there. Because I get a lot of people that say, yeah, well, if, it, if your parents hadn't given you your first camera, there's no way you would have succeeded. I've made seven figures in sales with my camera. So $1,500 versus over a million dollars, right? I mean, come on. So yes, that's how I got started. But you probably already have a camera if you are watching this and or listening to this on the podcast. So I think you're probably already ahead of where I started in gear. So let's pretend today's day one and you're getting started with barrel racing photography and you're wanting to kind of get get the show on the road, right? We're gonna get into how you're gonna get started real quick. Although that barrel race was at my parents' place, they weren't the producers. They weren't in charge of it. They were just the facility owners, right? So the producers of the barrel race, the ones that actually put it on, the ones that advertise it, the ones that drew the people in, right? They they were actually pretty impressed with my little system. You know, they came by to, to meet and greet and figure out what I was doing. And they'd never seen it done like that before because like I invented it myself. So like, whatever. I knew that other people had printed on site before because that's what Daryl did, but I didn't know how he did it or anything. I had no idea. So I just invented this from scratch based on how I thought it should operate. And it worked really good. We got a little, we had a little booth set up and we had, a, I brought my TV from my living room in, in my dorm in college. I just put it up under my arm, threw it in the truck and came up to this, this uh, barrel race. So I've gone through on YouTube, I've made a whole series about the booth. So I want you to go watch that 
and that will explain to you the whole thing about how the booth operates, how I operate the booth at almost every event. Like there's there's some little minor tweaks based on like the event and how it, like the flow of that event works. But generally speaking, that booth video will cover almost every event that you're gonna come across as a rodeo photographer. Uh, I've got guys that do MX, like motocross, uh, they they do the same kind of booth setup. They've learned from me and I've helped them with their setup. They're like, well, it's sort of like a similar kind of event structure and it is, it's true. So they do that with them. It, ha it works on all kinds of platforms. So go watch all those booth series videos. I put them into a playlist for you. So it's really easy. It's like a course that's free on YouTube. It's great. I think it's great. <laughs> that's just me, me talking, I guess. Anyway, those producers, they were so impressed with me and my system and my photos. And I was surprised because like, these are the first photos I've ever taken. And they were just like, wow, these are great. They said they, they invited me to go shoot their race. And that's how you get started. I mean, that is like the core of it right there. You get in somehow, you claw, you nail, you know, you bite, you scratch, you claw, you nail, you drag, whatever. You figure out how to get in. Right, so you maybe you already know some barrel racers. Maybe you could go photograph them practicing. We're gonna get into like how you can get started in a second, but just think like once you get your first one, it's just like let it compound, let it snowball, do a good job, and more work will come. That's been my whole motto the whole career. Okay, that's how I went from zero dollars to seven figures. All right, um, it's just that simple. Like do a good job, and you'll get more work. It's pretty. It's pretty straightforward. Believe it or not. I eventually had to go back to college. The internship ended and I went back to college. I was in Laramie going to UW, go Pokes. And uh, I decided I better start finding some barrel races in my local area that I could drive to in a, like less than four hours away, which is a pretty big circle. But Wyoming's pretty sparse, right? So I went down to Colorado and, and I met some barrel racing producers down there. I asked them if I could shoot their event. They let me shoot their event. And it was just like an annual event, so it was just once a year. So I couldn't rely on that as my sole source of income, right, naturally. So I had to find some other producers, but I did a good job there. And then some other producers had were waiting around for me when I wrapped up at the end of the day. They were sitting around waiting. And then my booth crew said, hey, Oli, these guys have been waiting to talk to you for a couple hours now. And uh, they've, they have uh, another event. They have a whole string. They have a whole series of barrel races and they said, we would love to you to come and do this system for us at our barrel race. And it's not, it's not huge, you know, they're not, they're not big producers or whatever, but they had a whole bunch of barrel races. They did like one every weekend, the whole season, and it was great. And they had, they had a couple in different areas. So I could get different clientele that would come to do the different barrel races in different areas, and it was great. We had like three different, four different arenas uh, that we would go run barrels at and it was pretty cool they were a fun group of people i enjoyed hanging out with them i, I like them personally which definitely helps and they ran a great production really right and they had an eye for finding people like me to bring in to make the production even better because when you are a really good photographer and you do a good job and your crew and you are taking care of the the contestants there and the other people that are around you and you're friendly and you're nice you're good to get along with all those things, then you get more gigs because more people want that at their event. Like producers aren't gonna beg somebody to come shoot their event if you're crabby and you're grumpy and you're you're just mean to people and you, you're not nice and you don't do things in like a, a quick way, right? If you just drag your feet for six months to get people their pictures, nobody's gonna wanna hire you again, right? They're not gonna wanna invite you to go shoot there. Now, a lot of these weren't paying gigs, so I said hired, but like I didn't get paid by the event i shot everything on spec as some people like to call it but i would just go there and shoot and do my best and try to have a good system in place and a good booth system in place and all of that forced me to be better at my job if you get paid you get lazy when you get paid to be there you think well i'm good enough i'm getting paid and la di da but if you are shooting on spec you've got to be really good you got to be better than you were yesterday and you're always trying to continuously prove and that's how you grow a business like that's how you get better and better and make more and more money um, a lot of photographers are trying to like ring the producers for a couple hundred bucks here and there and i'm telling you if you learn how to sell your pictures you learn how to take better pictures you learn how 
all of this thing works, the whole booth system, that's where you're gonna make all of your money. Like I made 72% of my money at the booth, the, and then the, the rest of it came through the website, and then a tiny little bit came through like magazines and stuff, some miscellaneous stuff. But the, the, the huge bulk of this whole project comes through the booth. So make sure you're doing the booth. And like in this course, I'm gonna spiel about here in a little bit, um, like I talked to you about like, timing out your shots and like figuring out exactly what pictures sell and what don't. Because if you're just like la di da di da not paying attention and you're just clicking away or you're doing the spray and pray, you, brrr, you know, like, yeah, you're eventually probably going to hit something, but not as many as like consistently getting good results every single time. Right. So it's really important for for us to like think about the whole thing. But if you're just getting started, I that's a that's a lot like it can feel it can feel daunting. It can feel overwhelming. It's all these emotions. Right. So in this course, I've I've like compressed seven years of knowledge and, and learning and sales experience and whatever down into this little course. And it's a pretty short course, really, if you think about it, I mean, seven years down to whoosh, so you, so you can do this too. You can do exactly what I did. I'm not special. I didn't even have a desire to do barrel, barrel racing photography. And if you're watching this or listening to this, you probably at least have some inclining that maybe you want to, or maybe you're doing something similar and you want to apply what you learned today to that. And you totally can. There's a lot of this applies to other things too, believe me. So as I, as I grew my business and I grew my network and I started star fishing, I kind of called it like where we would go, um, you know, we would make a star. It'd go from Laramie to the event, back to Laramie, to this event, back to Laramie, to that event, back to Laramie. And it just made like a star pattern around Laramie, right? I'd go to, I'd go to Cheyenne and I'd, I'd go to Greeley, I'd go to wherever. And, uh, and then I'd always have to come back. And so that eventually my, eventually I got out of school, right? I graduated college with a couple more degrees and, uh, and I was on my own and I thought, well, I don't want to keep coming back here to Laramie and have this as my base and be tied down. So eventually I got an RV where I could just go from event to event to event to event. And that was when I decided I'm not gonna go get a real job. I'm just gonna make this my real job. Uh, because in my in my first calendar year of taking pictures, uh, you know, from like January to December calendar year, I made six figures. I broke that six figure mark, not by a lot, but by, you know, 10,000 bucks or whatever. and. Uh, you know, busted through that six figure mark. And I looked at all of my buddies that had graduated college too, at the same time I did and what jobs they had, and they were in the same programs I was. And I'll tell you what, I was making quite a bit more than they were. And I was working way less, right? So what I was working on the weekends, I was making more than they were during the week. And that would compound and compound and compound over the weeks. And pretty soon I was making quite a bit more than all of my friends. And looking back, I thought, you know, why would I go get a real job and waste that 40 hours or whatever, waste those five days out of the week working for piddly nothing when I could invest that time back into photography, back into my skills, back into myself. And then I started to just live off of the income that I was getting from shooting barrel races and other events like team roping. So I quickly did the math on that, you know, and it, it was a gut wrenching thing. Like it took a while. I was like, man, do I, should I really like, is this, it felt like a risk, right? But it felt like a bigger risk not to, it felt like a bigger risk to just go and steadily plug away at some day job that I didn't like anyway. If you love your job, cool. I know some of you guys love your jobs and that's fine. You could definitely make this work. Uh, working your whole day, five days a week at your real job, and then the other two days a week, if it works out for you, that you have weekends off, because that's when barrel races usually are, uh, to shoot these barrel races and other events like that. Team roping's great, breakaway's great, these are all similar kind of things. All of this can be just like an added bonus to your regular paycheck. If you need you know, that security or you just wanna keep your day job, that's cool, no problem. But for me, I didn't want to. I didn't want a day job. I wanted to work for myself. I wanted to grow my own business, see how far I could push the envelope on this. And you know, the rest is kind of history, I guess. I shot some of the most prestigious events on the planet, some of the best, biggest payout. I shot barrel races that pay out over a million dollars, you know what I mean? So it, millions of dollars, big money barrel races, I was a photographer. <laughs> so uh, some of that, you know, it's just like, 
I started from nothing, right? I was, I was given a camera, sure, yeah, all right, if you wanna think that that's holding you back, that you weren't given a camera, if you think that's holding you back, then whatever, sell your camera and dip out of here because what's holding you back probably is like the, your mind, your mental, you know, you gotta get that right, you gotta think things differently if you want different results, right? This all had to come from my brain first, right? So like that initial booth setup, how we managed, you know, giving cards, you know, the memory card to the booth and, and having them show pictures and showing her what to do, all that just came out of my mind. And now I'm teaching you in this course that we're gonna talk about here in a little bit. But all of that, you know, like if I would have said, oh, it can't be done, then, you know, you just brush it off, your brain turns off, and then you just go on about your day. And I'll tell you what, I did not love my job. So I, I was highly motivated to find something else. And I'm sure glad I did. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you about it right now if I, if I had stuck to the old path and just drudged it out as a landman or, you know, used one of my other degrees to figure out something. I probably wouldn't be very happy either. So... Personally, for me, I'm much happier doing this, talking to you now, and dedicating my time to educating others, and then, you know, but for the last seven years, traveling full-time, it was just a good life, man. I just wanted to travel full-time, and that's what I wanted to do, and photography is how I did it. So if you're listening to this or watching this, then you are probably ahead of where I started, right? You probably have already figured out how to take pictures, right? You've probably been doing this for more than a week, I would imagine. If not, welcome to Equine Photo School. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> uh, you are in the right place to learn. That first week for me was super intense. I would stay up really late and watching YouTube on my iPad while I laid in bed with my ear earbuds in or whatever, had them plugged in. And uh, I was always scared that I was gonna fall asleep and get tangled up in my, my whole mess here. but. Um, that iPad would hit my face every night and that's when I knew it was time to actually go to sleep. And then I wasn't doing a very good job at work either. So I apologize to my previous boss, but I was trying to learn a new skill really fast. So if you want to put a deadline on yourself, give yourself some pressure to like learn this stuff. Cool. So I just learned this morning that this, the statistic that just kind of hit me and I was like, I want to talk to you guys about this. I want to make sure I include it in today's podcast and that was like you can learn anything just about anything in 20 hours i mean you can learn like the majority of something right in 20 hours and that's what i did like i'm proof in the pudding right here like i learned photography after work every night for a week i mean say i've spent four hours i spent more than that i bet uh because by the end of the week i was feeling pretty comfortable with you know how things were operating um Say I spent four hours a week for for five days, that's 20 hours. Like I invested major time and it was like on YouTube and courses like this and like I was trying to figure it out and figure out how all this stuff worked, right? And then also like how to print and a little bit of editing, but like that came later. All of that to say like you just dedicate four hours a week for the next, you know, five days if you can, dive through or take this course and it's gonna be way less than 20 hours and I'm gonna you know, distill all this information to you in this course. But let's just say like you're ready. Like you are you are 20 hours away from learning whatever you want. So get to tugging on that 20 hours and pulling that in towards you and consuming that information, bringing it in, keeping it right there. Don't let it escape. <laughs> uh, but you can you can learn all of this in like 20 hours and then you can be off to the races and then you're going to continue to learn forever like you never ever should stop learning but you could get over that initial hump of that 20 hours boom get you in there get you started super important to just go and not procrastinate not say yeah well, i'll do it tomorrow and then tomorrow never comes right we've all been there i've got things that i've wanted to do for 20 years and i've still never done them because i just never got started right like i think it'd be cool to play the guitar but i have no idea how and i'm not i'm not that interested I'm not motivated enough to like give it a shot but that was this guy's example he's like i learned guitar in 20 hours and now you know he like does some cool riff okay let's say you let's say you haven't started shooting barrel races at all right you're brand new to photography i'm really glad you're here first of all second of all like how do you get started right so in the course that i'm about to announce we're going to talk about 
how to get started like with your camera settings and, and how to shoot the barrel race and what barrel racing is and all that stuff. And we're gonna kind of, you know, take you in there. But for you to like get your first gigs and stuff, it's really, it's really kind of like, it can be challenging to get that first one. So for you to get that very first gig, I want you to think really small, okay? These, these big producers that are paying out millions of dollars, they're not gonna hire you, right? When you're first getting started. They're not gonna say, oh yeah, come shoot our huge multi-million dollar barrel race and it's your first one, yay, good luck, okay. Uh, they're just not, right, obviously. That doesn't mean you wouldn't do it in, in their shoes either, right? So what I want you to do is look locally. Look around your, your area, give yourself a radius that you're comfortable with. Say it's an hour away or four hours away or maybe it's 20 miles away, I don't know, whatever it is, right? There's probably a barrel race going on wherever you're at. If you're listening to this and you like horses and you're, you probably know where there's horse things going on in your local area, I would search on Facebook and look up some groups, try to find some barrel racing groups. A lot of these barrel racers are super active on Facebook groups, kinda, kinda gets crazy in there. So fair warning, like it can get wild, but a lot of producers will promote their event in these groups. So find a local barrel racing group to your area and then, you know, kind of start interacting with people, start meeting them, saying hi, you know, like using social media for being social, imagine that and not just plugging your photography business all the time, but you know, comment on some posts or whatever. Like, you know, like Gary V says, if you follow him, give your two cents, you know, like kind of say, hey, I'm here, hi, you know, try to be nice to people, that kind of thing, I know, shocking. Uh, simple stuff like that. Otherwise, you can pick up a local magazine, like my parents used to have the Wrangler Horse and Rodeo News. I would just, when I was in Laramie, I would thumb through that, I would find small events in there. How do you know they're small? Great question, right? they are buying smaller ads. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. <laughs> um, if, if their ads are small in magazines, their event is probably small. If they've got full page ads, they're probably a bigger deal, right? I mean, it's not always the case, but like that's kind of a, a rough rule of thumb, right? Just being in the magazine industry for a while, kind of like that's how I see things. The other thing is like on Facebook, you can't always tell by the size of the graphic, right? But if they have poor design choice, like if their ads kind of look amateur, they're probably amateur too, and that's okay. You are too, look where you're starting. You're just getting started, they're just getting started. You can grow with them, you can help them grow, they can help you grow. It's like a symbiotic relationship here. Super cool stuff. I would just get in with some of those uh, barrel racing producers there that are starting out small. Maybe they've got a local jackpot, maybe it's like a Tuesday nighter and they, you can go and shoot their Tuesday night jackpot. I, there's, it's unlikely that there's another photographer doing those little weekly weekday jackpots. Uh, they're just, they're not all that profitable. So don't expect that you're gonna break six figures doing that, but you can get started, right? You can practice what we teach in the course. So if you're going through the course, book those weekly night jackpots and even a weekend jackpot, you know, you're starting to step up into like a Friday nighter or a Friday, Saturday one or a Saturday, Sunday or a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And you know, pretty soon the bigger events, they start taking up more days, right? So um, I've shot barrel races that last a whole week. I've shot team ropings that last three weeks or whatever. So some of these big ones last a long time and they will seriously eat into your schedule. But when you're just getting started, take that time off of your regular day job, find a little jackpot that happens at night and uh, you know, go shoot them. Maybe they have 25 entries. Well, that's 25 opportunities for you to learn and practice what I teach in this course and go through your own booth system and hire a friend to help you with your booth system. I, some of my very best friends have came with me, travel all over the world. I've flown them to different, um, I've flown them to different states all that just help me and hang out. And then we, you know, if they have time, we'll hang out after the event's over and we'll just go do some exploring or have some fun. But just like, let it be fun. And you can, you know, sometimes your friends won't even accept a paycheck because they saw how much money we didn't take in that day. And they're like, nah, that's cool, <laughs> you know? But most of the time, like they need a little bit of money. You need some help. It's a match made in heaven. Things work out great. And then they're at the end of the day, you're helping your friends and they're helping you. And that's just feels good right so um you know that said like go watch the booth video on more about like how to do all that stuff 
that's way too much for this podcast and, and stuff today, but get back on track. The other thing that you can do to start getting in with these barrel racers is make friends with a barrel racer or a whole bunch probably. And when you're in these groups, reach out, make a post, say, hey, I would like to practice barrel racing photography. Is there an opportunity for me to come to you to practice taking your picture as you practice riding around the barrel? And say like, I don't expect you to make a smoke and run every time or whatever, but like as you are going around, I want practice so I can learn how this whole thing works. Say, hey, I'm taking this course through Equine Photo School and tag us Equine Photo School. <laughs> uh, just, just kidding. But go ahead and and say like, hey, I'm taking this course. I'm trying to learn barrel racing photography, and I would just love an opportunity to take pictures of barrel racers where there's no pressure. You know, it's not a timed event, no money's on the line, that sort of thing. Kind of explain what you're doing, right? That sort of thing. And have that same kind of explain what you're doing attitude. If you show up to a barrel race and there's already a photographer there and you know, like they have the, the event, because usually photographers like myself were booked out a year in advance or more. Um, there's events that I had just in perpetuity, just forever, just know like this is your event forever, you know? So don't go to those and just assume that you can take pictures too. If there's an OP there, an official photographer, just ask them, make sure it's cool. Even if like you just wanna shoot exhibitions and if you don't know what exhibitions are, I'm gonna tell you real quick. Uh, exhibitions are basically practice runs. They put up a dollar or five dollars or whatever trivial amount to just have a minute or a, a small period of time, 30 seconds, a minute, whatever, in the arena to run around some practice barrels, train on their horses, kind of kind of get ready for like usually the next day or later during the day, the barrel race that's about to happen when there is money on the line and they're trying to go fast. They just want to give their horses like a little opportunity to kind of see the pattern in that arena and, and, and practice basically. It's just like a practice run before the real run. So if you want to shoot that, most official photographers are going to be like, yeah, cool, no problem, because we don't want to shoot that because hardly anybody ever buys that. Now, I've shot it back when I was getting started. That's how I got lots of practice right away because like that 10,000 hour mark, right? So when I was getting started and I already had events booked, I would just show up early and shoot the exhibitions too for some extra practice because it didn't hurt to have a little extra practice. Now, at this point in my career, I've shot over 3 million photos and they're on my website, so you can go look at them. But I've shot three million photos, so I, I feel like I'm pretty practiced up. But when you're first getting started, that first thousand or 10,000 or 15,000 pictures, that's gonna still feel kinda rusty and kinda like, oh, I don't really, you're not really feeling it yet, okay? But wait till you get 100,000 pictures under your belt and then you're like, okay, I'm starting to feel pretty good about my timing and getting stuff down, right? So that said, like, you can practice during like their practice at home with like one one barrel racer that probably has a few horses or you can go to like exhibitions and practice doing that while they're practicing you can practice it's like a win-win right so um most people will let you do that it shouldn't be a problem just make sure you ask make sure you communicate your intentions before you do that uh don't expect to show up to just any old barrel race and be able to shoot it's not really okay for, mo for the most part. If you're interested in shooting barrels, and if you've listened to the podcast or watched this video for this long, then you're darn sure interested, right? You're gonna need to eventually take on a barrel race and shoot a, an actual barrel race. And that can be daunting and it can be a little scary, a little intimidating. Believe me, I've been there. I'm like, well, I don't, like, you know, my first one was at my parents' house and like that was a little less intimidating because it was just like in their, their own arena, right? And I grew up there, whatever. But once I started booking my own events, it was like pretty intimidating. You know, I was like, man, this is this is like a real barrel race and people have paid money to be here and they're gonna be real mad. Barrel racers get real mad real quick. Some of their fuses are real short. They're gonna get mad if I screw this whole thing up, you know, and I felt a lot of pressure on me to like capture the moment and like whatever. So I let that pressure turn into a diamond, right? I turned that coal with all that pressure, made it into a diamond and I made something of that, right? But some of you that pressure doesn't really do well you can't handle pressure real well so take just be your own kind of guide on that one but like ease into it as much as you need to if you want to just shoot little barrel races for the next couple of years then totally okay there's no problem with that just kind of like you know take a take a gut check and feel like how do you how do I feel about this how does this 
you know you want it to like align with you and how you feel right and how you how you react to things but getting started with barrel racing photography can be like this daunting task it can be overwhelming there's a lot to think about like where to sit where to shoot from what gear do you need uh, camera settings how to get gigs how to keep gigs how to sell pictures all this stuff like do you need a website do you need a booth do you need you need a crew like there's all this stuff to think about and that it can be a lot and don't let me overwhelm you right now just know that i've thought about that stuff for you and i've created a, a nice little course and packaged it up with put a little bow on it for you made it really simple and that course is coming soon so this is a little pre a precursor if you will kind of just pushing it out there letting you know this course is coming so coming soon the equine photo school barrel racing photography you can see it now right name and lights okay and i, I don't know I think I'm getting better at making courses too. So if you've taken some of the other courses, just know like as I make more courses, <laughs> they're getting better. And I'm trying to niche down into like the different events because I feel like we've kind of talked about lighting like 101 to 301, like that's been a great course. And I've done collages, a couple of those. We've taken some horse pictures courses. We've done some courses, done quite a few courses. I've done a few workshops and I'm getting better personally at, at putting that content out there and making it better. And like, I've already got some like printables on this one. I've got some downloadables. I've got some like other things going on that like just didn't show up in other courses because like I wasn't ready for all of that work, right? So I'm easing into this. We're getting better. I think this is going to be a great course. I've really put a lot of thought into barrel racing photography over the years. I've taken a lot of notes. I've got notebooks full of like stuff that I've been perusing back through uh, to kind of implement into this course and make sure that while I was shooting barrel races i was thinking about teaching this later so i've taken some pretty good notes <laughs> so that was all the year benefit this course is going to be self-directed so you can take it at your own leisure you can take it right as soon as it's available and i put a link and i'm going to put an email out there so make sure you're subscribed to our email list i'm going to blast out an email and put it all over social uh, that this course is ready for enrollment but once you enroll, you have lifetime access. So you can just stay, you can come back later. So if you're a beginner, right? And you figure out all the beginner things and then you go shoot barrel races for six months, let's say, and you come back and you're like, all right, I feel really comfortable. I've done all these things. I'm starting to grow, like what's next? And then you go and you watch the stuff that's like next. So we got like freshman, sophomore, junior level, senior level stuff. Uh, all in this course. So as you progress in your career and in your skills, just come on back to this course later and review that stuff. Or if you've already shot Sparrow Races for a while and you kind of got the feel of that stuff, skip on ahead, no problem. I'm not gonna put any rules in place. <laughs> um, because like what I'm doing is I'm making a course that's big for a wider audience, right? But just take what you need out of the course and don't feel overwhelmed by all of it because you can always come back later and review the rest of the information not a big deal so we talk about the gear uh like like beginner gear intermediate pro level gear we talk about all that stuff that you need so you can think about you can look at what you've got now and see like oh maybe i just need this one little thing and then let's get rolling you probably already have enough gear to get started i don't want gear to hold you back it didn't hold me back I got a printer and a camera and a lens and a chair. I stole a chair out of my, my apartment. Uh, I just like brought my own stuff that I already own. I brought that TV that I already own, the laptop I already own. You probably already have this stuff too. You know, your spouse or significant other or roommate <laughs> might be upset that you took the TV, but I'll tell you what, it was my TV, so I took it. Um, whatever it takes. I think you've already got the stuff, shop your house. I've talked about that on the podcast before. Just look around and find stuff that will fit into your, that you could use as photography and office supplies, okay? Uh, there's plenty of that to go around. Okay, I'm not gonna hold anything back in this course. I'm gonna teach you every single thing that I know, and if it doesn't come up in the first iteration of this course, I'm just gonna keep adding to it. So if you buy now and you have lifetime access to it, as new updates come in, I'll blast all the students that are in the course. I'll say, hey, guess what? new information in the course so it's like getting a little a little micro course for free as you know time goes on the course just gets better pretty cool all right the other thing is 
I'm gonna show you all of all of the like the little tiny things that I can't even talk about on the podcast because I need to show you and I could do it on YouTube here, but it's this whole production of things and I need of somebody to help film me doing it and it's is a lot and that's gonna make it into the course. Like I'm gonna show you how I figure out exactly where the best place to sit is, no matter the size of the arena, the shape of the arena, whatever's going on, I figure out exactly, I pinpoint the exact spot to sit. And then because I'm so consistent in where I sit and what I do, that I can be relied on so people go, they know what they're gonna see when they get to the booth, but more importantly, the I don't know if it's more importantly, but also <laughs> I can help the producers put up banners in exactly the right spot so they show up in every single picture every time. Every time somebody goes around that barrel, boom, there's a banner in the exact right spot because I know where my timing lands and how the horse and rider are gonna look. So I'll position a banner so it's in the perfect spot every time. <laughs> it's just one of those things that you learn as you go. So I think a lot of people that just kind of shoot rodeos generally or whatever, they're not really thinking about that. I figure out how to make every barrel line up to me perfectly every time. I have a meeting with the barrel setters. We got all kinds of stuff. So we do a lot and I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach you all of this stuff in the course. More than I can talk about, we're running out of time over here. But like I said earlier, I'm in the middle of building this course, so it's not quite done yet. But if you go to equinephotoschool.com, you can fill out the, fill it. But if you go to equinephotoschool.com, there's gonna be a pop-up, you can put in your email address there, and I'll be sure to email everybody uh, when this course is ready for enrollment. And then of course, I'll blast it on social media, so follow us on Equine Photo School on Facebook and Instagram, Twitter. I don't really do much on Twitter, but it's there. If you are a Twitter head, then hey, tweet me. All of this is to say that photography could just be a hobby, could be a fun thing that you do, and maybe maybe you wanna take this barrel racing course to get a little bit better at your hobby, or you kinda wanna take some slightly better um, barrel racing pictures of your kids, right? And you, you just wanna get better at that sort of thing, this course, great for that. It's great for just kind of getting started and getting rolling, figuring out camera settings, lighting, that kind of stuff, right? Not strobes though, because I got a whole entire course on strobes and that eventually does, part of that course focuses on barrel racing photography. So if you want to learn all about strobes, do the lighting 101 to 301 and then go to the barrel racing part of that course and learn how to strobe barrel races just like I do. The other thing is, once you go to equinephotoschool.com, there's lots of other like blog posts and all this stuff going on there. So hopefully you're, you've dived into that wealth of information as well. If you're listening to the podcast, surely you've gone to equinephotoschool.com. I hope this could just be a hobby or it could surpass your real job income, right? If, you, if you're sick of your job, which a lot of people are, and you wanna pursue photography as a full-time gig, then stick around, because I'm here to help you. If you wanna schedule a VIP day with me, I can dang sure just like, let's dive in together. Let's work on getting your business up there, up and running, going to the next level, whatever it is. I'm here to get you there. I'm here to get you to that seven-figure mark if that's what you wanna do. If you wanna make a substantial amount of income, reach out, like I will help you. That's we do this all the time. I've got VIP days, I've got coaching calls, I've got all this stuff, you can just schedule that right in the scheduler. It's really slick, it's really easy, I've made it simple. I hope I've inspired you a little bit to take barrel racing photography a little bit more seriously and maybe take this course. So hopefully that's it. And happy shooting.